your comments and uh, look forward to any questions you have. Feel free to interrupt at any time. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things related to uh, some of the concepts I'll be talking about. Uh, and just a little bit of background, uh, I have studied survival analysis for a long time and I love the field of survival analysis, but I started to get the feeling it was a bit overused. And there's some longitudinal ways of thinking about things that are in some ways more natural uh, than survival analysis. I hope to expand on that theme. And this is especially true when you have say more than one type of event that you're interested in. Uh, so I'm gonna start with uh, a general sort of model that's useful in univariate analysis, but also very useful and longitudinal analysis, and that's the proportional odds model. So I'm a big fan of semi-parametric models. And this is uh, probably the second most commonly used semi-parametric model, the first being the Cox proportional hazards model. So one way of stating the proportional odds model is I like to state it in terms of exceedance probabilities, because then the regular binary logistic model is exactly the same form. It has only one intercept, whereas for the ordinal model, we have as many intercepts as you have distinct y values, less one. So we state the cumulative probability uh, or probability y greater or equal to little y, given that covariance is the x bit, one over one plus e to the minus uh, function of the intercept at the y uh, threshold or cutoff value. Uh, plus your ordinary regression uh, linear predictor. So you just notice the, the Y index is the intercepts. And uh, this, this is one of those models that has more than one intercept, just like the Cox proportional hazards model. We just don't write them down at the same time. They're usually stored away in a separate underlying survival curve, but really you could write the Cox model exactly this way with a different link function. So why, why are semi-parametric models so uh, useful where well, they're, they're transformation invariant? Uh, they use the ordering of Y, but they don't use the spacings of the Ys. So whether the Y variable is numeric or not, it doesn't matter. It's, it's just using the ordering. And if you have an outcome that's discrete, like uh, pain-free, pain or death, it does not assume that the distance between pain-free and pain is the same as the distance between pain and death. Uh, and it handles arbitrarily heavy ties, including clumping at zero, floor and ceiling effects, uh, bimodality, uh, continuous outcomes, semi-continuous outcomes. And it's a direct competitor of the linear model to such a degree that I almost never use linear models anymore because I just got tired of having to worry about whether I've transformed the outcome variable properly uh, for a linear model. Frank, excuse me for uh, interrupting. Could you turn up your volume? Um, some, um, some of us are having a hard time here. Yeah, sorry about that. Let me... Um, Thank you. Is that any better now? I'll just put the microphone closer. Good, thanks for speaking up. Okay. Um, one of the interesting things about the proportional odds model is it's um, in the case where there's no covariates, it's, it's, it's not only similar to the Wilcoxon test, it is the Wilcoxon test. Uh, and so if you were to simulate a large number of studies where you're comparing two groups, and if you were to look at the uh, at predicting the Wilcoxon statistic from the uh, log odds ratio from the proportional odds model, the R squared is 0.996 for predicting the Wilcoxon statistic from the odds ratio. And the uh, score test in the proportional odds model is uh, the numerator of the score test is exactly the Wilcoxon statistic. So there's a strong tie with those. And there's a simple conversion if you uh, wanted to convert a, a uh, odds ratio to the zero to one scaled version of the Wilcoxon statistic, which is a concordance probability. Uh, you just take this function of the odds ratio and you'll almost exactly get the, the scaled Wilcoxon statistic, whether or not the proportional odds assumption holds. So a lot of people are worried about the proportional odds assumption. And I meet people uh, 
that worry about that assumption and they don't worry about any other assumption in anything they do like normality or equal variance or proportional hazards. But for some reason, proportional odds model is scrutinized more than any model I've ever dealt with. And that kind of scrutiny is just not called for in, in this sense here. And likewise, if you move it to the multi-group situation, which is the, Wilco which is the uh, cross Wallace test, and you had a beta coefficient that was uh, contrasting the jth group uh, with the ith group of, of a multi-treatment comparison, uh, the, that coefficient reflects the concordance probability or Wilcoxon type statistic for X versus Y computed on just the observations that are either in treatment I or treatment J. And I have a blog article that goes uh, into this um, Wilcoxon proportionalized comparison in, in a lot more detail that you can see the link there. Uh, and then you can extend the model to the partial proportionalized model and the constrained partial proportional odds model, uh, which is analogous to uh, the unequal variance um, uh, in, in the linear model. So when you have uh, unequal variances, um, that will give you non-parallelism of the normal inverse distribution functions in the normal case. And that will be similar to lack of parallelism due to not being in proportional odds, but you can allow uh, that to be handled with a partial proportional odds model that was from uh, 1990. So how does all this relate to anything? Well, let's start, start talking about longitudinal models. Uh, there are full likelihood extensions to all sorts of models, whether you're talking about parametric or semi-parametric. Um, and uh, I just, wrote a blog article and put this up about a week ago about this particular topic, and I've gotten a lot of interest in it. A lot of statisticians are taught that you sort of throw random effects into a model to handle correlation or clustering of subjects. And um, if you're not careful, that can actually assume one of the most unrealistic of all correlation structures, which is compound symmetry. Um, in other words, the correlation doesn't go down as the distance in time goes up. Um, and, and also when you have uh, random effects models, those are not able to handle absorbing states. So if you have, uh, let's say one of your states is death, uh, once you're in an absorbing state, you have kind of a re repetition of your outcome variable over and over, and that would generate huge random effects. Uh, so uh, random effects models are just not made for absorbing states. But in Markov models, you can handle not only continuous uh, outcomes, but you can handle binary, ordinal, multinomial, and you can handle any number of absorbing states with a Markov model. It, Markov models, to my mind, are the most flexible ways to do longitud longitudinal data analysis. Also the easiest to program because it uses standard software. And the only thing that's not really standard about it is once the fitting is finished, you have to go to a post fitting step to get unconditional probabilities. Uh, so you need to uncondition on the previous state to get a marginal distribution at a given time. There's other ways to do this with marginal models and Jonathan Schilkraut just had uh, a big paper about this in statistics and medicine just uh, two or three weeks ago. And it's those marginal met models can directly uh, model the probability of state occupancy. Whereas for a Markov model, we have to go through an extra step to do that, which I'll show you that step. So you can use a semi-parametric model to give you extremely flexible longitudinal modeling. And um, with a, a discrete time Markov proportional odds model, uh, you're using a proportional odds model, uh, but you're conditioning on the previous state if it's a first order uh, Markov process, and you might be conditioning on a gap in time between the last measurement. So if your measurement times are T1, T2 to Tm, uh, and the measurement at time T for one person is Y of T, then the first order Markov uh, proportional odds or really any, any semi-parametric model that uses a cumulative probability family 
you would have a different length in exped, but it's the same form. So the probability at time t sub i of being greater than or equal to y, given the baseline covariance and given the state at the previous time period, is just the same form. It's a transition model instead of a current state. You have your intercept, you have your regression coefficients for baseline, and then you have some part of the model that you can write in many different ways that would parametrically model the effect of the previous state and then absolute time might be important and the time gap might be important. Uh, so you might have a dependence on the previous state that wanes with time or increases with time. For example, if, if patients in uh, the intensive care unit get more stable over time, you would have a dependence of the previous state that increases with time and time would be involved in that positive way. Uh, so how would you model the previous state? Well, it might be a numeric uh, coding, a very parametric linear sort of coding uh, for the, pre the, the way the previous state affects the current state or you might have a single binary indicator for a specific state, such as a lowest or highest state. You might have a discontinuous bilinear relationship. This is just showing you the flexibility. So you might be modeling in a COVID study, uh, you might be modeling the severity of the current state of the patient, uh, where um, when the patient is in the hospital, things behave a certain way. And as soon as they get discharged, home, there's kind of a break in the action and uh, things behave differently. So that could be done with kind of a, a, a bilinear relationship in the previous state that has, a, has an elbow at the point at which you move from uh, inpatient to outpatient status. So what are the most important effects to include in a, a first order Markov longitudinal model? Well, the previous state is going to dominate. And that's going to be true whether you have a binary outcome or a continuous outcome. So if your continuous outcome is you're measuring serum cholesterol every month, uh, the current cholesterol is going to be predicted fairly accurately from the cholesterol measured a month ago. And then you need a flexible function of time since uh, time zero, such as randomization in a clinical trial. If you had no time effect, that would correspond to a constant hazard rate. Uh, you often need a non-proportional odds effect for absolute time. And the reason for that, and this is one of the few complications of the model, um, is the mix of events can change over time. So you might have ventilator use in the intensive care unit tends to occur early and death may occur late. So to have, to have the mix of events change over time just means you have non-proportional odds with regard to time. It doesn't mean non-proportional odds with regard to any other variable in the model. And then you might have an interaction between time and previous state. That's the example that I already mentioned a moment ago. Uh, other effects to include might be a function of time gaps. Uh, you might have an interaction between previous state and a gap time, uh, interaction between time and treatment. If the treatment effect is delayed, this is just a classical time by treatment interaction that you might have in any kind of longitudinal model. So the unifying approach comes from this. Uh, we, we have uh, the ability to handle all kinds of situations with this setup. And so uh, let's suppose you had a very simple case for which survival analysis is ideal, which is you have a single event type and it's a terminating event, uh, such as death. And so if you're modeling time to terminate an event, the transition probability uh, in that situation is exactly the discrete hazard rate. And so that if you're modeling things as a longitudinal uh, current status model, um, the odds ratio and hazard ratio are almost identical. And that's because the time intervals, uh, when the time intervals are small, your event rates are small. So the odds ratio uh, very closely approximates the hazard ratio. So you're actually just building up a Cox proportional hazards model with a binary sequence. Efron wrote about this in the 1970s in a very beautiful paper. 
but this formulation will easily handle time-dependent covariates and left truncation and other complexities without any sort of special likelihoods. But when you extend it beyond the time until a terminating event uh, into recurrent events, that's when you really see this thing shine. Uh, and so you know that if you're doing a renewal process or some sort of recurrent event analysis, there's sort of a separate literature it's all part of survival analysis, but there's a lot of statisticians that really know how to do time until first event, but they don't necessarily know how to do recurrent event. It takes a somewhat different method, although you can embed it in a fairly general approach, uh, but the recurrent events and the terminated events are just treated in the same uh, framework once you get into longitudinal thinking. And there's only recently in the literature an extension to handle recurrent events in the presence of a terminating event. That's, that's a little bit complex, but in a longitudinal approach, it's, it's nothing complex whatsoever. So you can have recurrent events such as hospitalization, and then you could have a death interrupting the flow of hospitalization you can handle competing risk. Now, this is assuming that you're okay with explicitly counting death as a bad outcome. I've worked with several very intelligent statisticians who will tell me that if you have an intensive care unit study and, um, and how early you can get somebody well enough to go home um, is their outcome of interest, say time to recovery, that they really do not want to count death as a bad outcome. I have some serious issues with that way of thinking, but I've heard some uh, really good statisticians say they want to isolate the effect of death from the other outcomes, such as successful discharge home. I don't generally want to do that. And I did a, a, a Twitter survey about that and put that up on an article. Most, most statisticians and clinical trialists do not wish to separate death from the other outcomes. Um, the, the, uh, the way of thinking with longitudinal data is much easier to interpret than competing risks. I've tried to interpret competing risks for decades, and every time I think about it, I get a little bit lost. I finally read a clear explanation uh, with the right wording that really helps me that if you're you're studying time until heart attack and the heart attack can be interrupted by death and you're going to get a cumulative incidence function for heart attack that is recognizing death as a competing event. What that, what that incidence is estimating is the probability of having a heart attack that precedes death. And it's those three words that really are all important. The probability of a heart attack that precedes death it's what you get from a competing risk analysis. And I'm not sure I really know how to interpret that. I don't want to have kind of a clause, a conditional clause put on my endpoint. I want to really estimate kind of unconditional probabilities. Now, the uh, transition models and other longitudinal models are really set up for handling serial current status data. And once you're handling serial current status data, you can handle events of different severities very easily. And part of this process, by having the, the weekly or monthly current status of a patient, you don't need to judge whether an early heart attack is worse than a late death. There's many methods that are posed in the literature for handling multiple, multiple events where you have to make judgments like that. And when you're, when you're doing a state transition model, you don't have to make that judgment. It, it may come into play with which state occupancy probabilities or mean time and state you wish to calculate, but you don't have to make a judgment like this. Everything is very time oriented uh, with longitudinal intervals. You can also handle missing data and interval censored uh, measurements. So I'll show you some examples of these things. You can handle standard longitudinal continuous outcomes. We know that, for example, the proportional hazards model and the proportional odds model handle continuous outcomes extremely well. It's just a little more computation because of the number of intercepts. But we have R, an R package that will handle 6,000 intercepts with no problem at all. 
Um, longitudinal continuous or ordinal outcomes interrupted by clinical events can be handled in a longitudinal framework, and you can handle multiple absorbing states. So here's some examples. The first would be what we think of as ideal for survival analysis, and it really is. You have a terminating event, and uh, you have status at each time interval of alive or dead. These could be daily, weekly, monthly. And so somebody who's followed for three weeks who didn't suffer the event, their data will look like zero, zero, zero. Somebody that died at two weeks will have a zero, one. And when you analyze this uh, with a pooled logistic model, as Brad Efron did long ago, you'll get a hazard ratio. Uh, the odds ratio will be indistinguishable from the hazard ratio. Uh, but you can extend this to multiple levels. So you could have the person's OK because they were good enough to go home. They were hospitalized. They had a myocardial infarction or they died. And so a longitudinal record might look like this for somebody hospitalized at three weeks, uh, went home, they were rehospitalized at seven weeks, they had a heart attack at eight weeks, they stayed in the hospital and then their follow-up ends at 10 weeks. So you have 001, that is hospitalization, home, 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 rehospitalization, uh, heart attack, uh, still in the hospital, and uh, still in the hospital, and then that's their information stops at that point, the end of follow-up. But we can get a lot more interesting than that. So let's suppose your outcome is quality of life, where a zero is best and six is poor. So it's a zero to six quality of life scale. Myocardial infarction is a seven, stroke is an eight, and nine, nine is death. We're going to assume death is worse than, than anything else here. And so the quality of life is going to vary over your uh, weeks, and it's not assessed on the third week. But the patient is known to not have had an event on the third week. So they're free of uh, heart attack, stroke, or death, but the quality of life was not assessed. So what, what are the raw data? Uh, okay, they were quality of life of uh, almost perfect here, a little worse here. It wasn't assessed here, so you have interval censoring. Uh, so I have one of my R packages will handle interval censoring for ordinal uh, data. So that's an interval censored point at three weeks, and then you have actual quality of life measurements all throughout these weeks. And then there was a stroke at week uh, uh, eight and a, a, a de at the next to last week, and then a death at the, at the end. Here's someone who had a heart attack status that we forgot to assess at seven weeks. So we have interval sensor quality of life. It's not missing data. And you don't need to use multiple imputation. You just need to calculate the likelihood component for a uh, status known to be between zero and six. And then here, um, the quality of life is known to be a five but we don't know if the patient uh, had a heart attack or not because we didn't assess the status. So this is not interval sensor, this is a dis discontiguous uh, censoring. I don't have software that will do that, but it would be fairly easy to program the likelihood component to get your maximum likelihood or Bayesian analysis. Uh, so we know the quality of life is not a six because we know it's a five, but we don't know if the heart attack is gonna override that. Um, so you can see that you turn uh, really messy, missing data problems into partial information problems that can be handled with the full likelihood solution. It doesn't take any ad hoc sort of solution. And there's a general statistical philosophy that, that rears its head at this point, which is what I've come to believe over my last uh, 10 or 20 years as a statistician is that the closer you get to the raw data, the better things work. So if you say time until first event, uh, when you have multiple events, that's not really respecting the raw data at all. And time to first event doesn't, doesn't even capture subsequent hospitalizations. Time to first event will count somebody who dies after a heart attack as somebody who didn't die. The death is totally ignored. Uh, so. I've just found that things work better. The modeling is easier to set up. Uh, things are more efficient. You gain power by being closer to the raw data. 
And instead of thinking time to event, think about current status in intervals such as days, weeks, or months, or years. Frank, can I ask quickly, it needs to be put on that type of grid. Uh, everyone needs to be measured at each specific time point, or can, is it more flexible than that? So the, the formulation that I'm using right now is, is more for a uniform grid. Um, the, the time points don't have to be uh, equally spaced. It's best if the timing is intended to be regular, like day one, three, seven, 14 would work. Um, what, what the discrete time approach does not allow you to do is to estimate incidences at days that you didn't collect data. So you can't use it to interpolate at all, but you can use it to estimate incidences at the days that you intended to collect. So there are some issues if you have really random timings um, in which you cannot infer the, um, the status at the same time for every person. So there are some special things that come out, come up in that case that need to be dealt with. Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. One other example of the sort of thing you can handle is you could have a continuous outcome um, and it could take 200 levels in an ordinal sense and it may have a clinical override. So an example would be you're measuring kidney function with serum creatinine, uh, but some patients uh, not just not just had dysfunction of the kidneys, but they, they needed an emergency kidney dialysis. So the dialysis would override the kidney function measure and you would just code dialysis as a serum creatinine of 10 or whatever is higher than all of your real points. The 10 doesn't actually get used in the analysis, but that's a clinical override with a higher ordinal category. So the, you don't have any problem with floor and ceiling effects with these kind of discontinuous overrides in an ordinal analysis. So uh, what are some applications? Well, we have a lot of applications related to cr critical, critical illness and um, uh, COVID uh, therapeutic trials that we're doing or have done. And I did a reanalysis of a really wonderful trial from National Heart Lug and Blood Institute Pedal Network of Clinical Trialists called the VIOLET trial. That's a study of the use of vitamin D in critically ill adults. These are mainly people that have respiratory failure or severe respiratory distress in the intensive care unit. And they measure daily assessments on a four level ordinal outcome for 28 days with almost no missing data. So it's a very wonderful data set. So your outcomes are you're at home, that's your best level, hospitalized, but you didn't need to be on a ventilator you were on a ventilator or you had acute respiratory distress syndrome or you were dead. And so there's um, uh, websites you can go to uh, and I'll show you the uh, URLs to the homepage for these things where I have like 80 page uh, report that goes through detailed analysis and alternate analyses and looking at model assumptions. And uh, one of the things that came out of that that I really am fond of is uh, looking at the fit of the model when you have a longitudinal state transition model for a four level ordinal outcome. These are levels and so death is the absorbing state and you see the incidence, the cumulative incidence of death as you go from day one to day 28. It, it cannot go back down like the non-absorbing states can. So it's always getting bigger or staying the same. Then you have the next worst category, which is shrinking. And then you have the next worst category and then you have the best category. But when you, when you look at the raw data and you don't do any covariate adjustment, these are the proportions of state occupancies uh, for the four states over time. And when you fit the longitudinal Markov uh, first order semi-parametric ordinal model, proportional odds model, that's a mouthful. This is the predictions from the model, and these are the observed proportions. And if you just use that model to simulate a new trial, of course, that's going to match what the model actually fits. Uh, but the reason that this is cool is that when you want to do a power calculation um, and, and other things that you might want to study, it's, it's really easy to simulate off of these 
uh, fitted models to simulate new clinical trials. But right now, just focus on the agreement between this and this. So we were able to really uh, do a nice job fitting the data in a very realistic fashion. And it really goes further than that because you, you can look at second order fit. A second order fit is what most statisticians don't generally quite take enough time to do. Uh, and, and there's two ways that you can do it, maybe more. So one way is to add a random effect to the model. So in a Markov process, you're assuming that the transitions are conditionally independent given the previous state. Well, what if the, uh, the, the conditional independence isn't quite true? you might add a random effect to your transition model. And if those random effects are large, that would tell you there's more to the story. What happened in the um, Violet study is the random effects were tiny and the variance of the random effects was tiny. So the random effects were negligible. So this is a nice assessment of the adequacy of the first order marker process and whether there's a correlation sort of structure that's not really captured. And this really showed you that the random effects are not adding anything to that model. So it made me more confident. The other thing to do is a variogram. So uh, one thing that I've been a little bit sad about is in statistical education, uh, there are people that do uh, time series analysis that will that will know what a variogram is. And there are people that do longitudinal studies, especially in clinical trials, that really know what random effects are and mixed effects models, but they don't necessarily, they were not necessarily taught all of the tools for checking the assumptions of longitudinal models. So we know the QQ plot and other standard plots, residual plots are very important in longitudinal models, just like in univariate models. But the variogram is, is uh, one of the key tools for looking at the correlation structure. Does it agree uh, with what your model is assuming the correlation structure looks like? And so sometimes I'll ask a, a biostatistician, uh, did, you, did you draw a variogram to check your correlation structure? And they said, varia what? And they'd never even heard the term variogram. I don't know what is your experience, but... Uh, if we're not teaching what a variogram is and how to draw it, I think that's a major gap in education. So a variogram is um, looking at all possible pairs of observations within one subject and sort of looking at the covariance of those pairs of observations as a function of the, the time gap between the, when the two measurements were made. So it, it's more on a, on a covariance scale uh, and you plot the covariance versus the time gap. And like if you have uh, a compound symmetric structure, which would be just random intercepts in the model, the variogram would be flat. Um, if you had an AR1 process, it's gonna be more like, uh, it's, it's gonna be more like monotonic, but not flat. Uh, so instead of covariance, I'm just looking at a regular correlation. I'm just, I'm just doing a correlation coefficient of these one to four outcomes. And I'm looking at all possible distances between two measurements on the same person. And then I'm, I'm pulling all that over the, separately for each time gap. And this is the observed, uh, this is like a variogram. So this is correlation structure. Now, if, if you had a uh, correlation structure that depended only on the gap, but not on absolute time, you would have only one curve. So you would have none of this vertical stuff. You would just have one curve. That's called an isotropic correlation pattern. It depends only on the gap. Here you see the correlation structure in this 28-day study depends on the gap, and it also depends on absolute time. But the interesting thing is if you look at the correlation structure in the observed data as a function of gap time and absolute time, absolute time is going vertically, uh, this is the pattern you see. This is the pattern that you get from simulating a large number of patients from the fitted uh, semi-parametric uh, transition model. And so what you're doing is you're also recovering second order properties um, 
we didn't perfectly recover it because if it was perfect, this, this line that's down here, you know, this line would be down there. But I would say overall, in terms of the patterns that we're recovering in these second order properties, I'd say the fit is, is better than I had hoped for. So now, once you get transition probabilities, you have to get to what more people are interested in is state occupancy probabilities where you're, they're more unconditional probabilities. Frank, may yes. I ask a quick question about the variogram, interpreting that in the simulation? Does that mean a little bit that it implies that the variability and the simul the variances in the simulation are smaller because it doesn't extend quite as far down, or is that yeah, different? It's more the the correlation is a little too big in this uh, it, it, for one of our regions of time on the absolute scale. Mm -hmm. So I, I forget whether this is the early or late times. Okay, I think it's late. So the, we're overestimating correlation in some late times compared to what is in observed data. Okay, so thank we're, you. We're estimating like a 0.5 and it should be a 0.4 correlation. Still, it's amazing, but I just was wondering how to interpret it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's correlation, not so much variance, but yeah. Okay. I'm not too unhappy with that. So when you have equal time spacing, the unconditioning on previous states is, is just a recursive multiplication. And so you're, you just use the law of total probability. So the probability of being at a certain level of the outcome at time t, given only the baseline and not any intermediate states, is the sum of the probabilities of being at that, at that outcome level, given the baseline and given the previous state over all possible previous states, J is one to K, times the probability of the conditioning event. So just use the law of total probability. You notice this, nest, this has to be solved for using T minus two. So it's a recursive formula. You just build up and it's just a sim essentially a, a, a matrix, a continued matrix product or matrix exponential. And it's, it's not that uh, slow to calculate. And so this will give you a semi-parametric unconditional, it's just conditional on X, distribution of Y at each time. So these are the state occupants, occupancy probabilities. And in the RH miss package, I have two functions that make this really easy to calculate for both Bayesian and frequentist models, at least for a first order process. Uh, now that leads to a host of S demands, and this is where the richness of the longitudinal approach really comes in. So you're starting off with your fundamental parameters are things like transition odds ratios. So that's the, your original parameters, but then you can get prior state and covariate specific transition probabilities simply from those uh, log odds effects. But then you can get covariate specific uh, state occupancy probabilities. For example, what's the probability of having a stroke in week four or death in or before week four? So that is a state occupancy probability in or before because that's a, that's a uh, terminating state or absorbing state. So probability of having a stroke or being dead in week four or, or, uh, or dying before week four you can calculate the probability of being a, having a stroke but still being alive. So notice these are unconditional probabilities. They're not things like uh, in a competing risk analysis, what's the probability of having a heart attack that precedes death? You're not doing something like that. That's so nebulous to me, but you're giving more of a direct event that you're calculating the probability of. Time and state is something that's very commonly used in state transition modeling. And in survival analysis, if you had a single terminating event, that is, that is really the, the restricted mean survival time. So you can do something just like that, but more generality. Uh, what is the mean number of weeks in state three, for example, or state three or four? So it can be the time in states greater than or equal to something or states two or three. So this could be say the mean number of weeks in which you were not well, that would be a nice summary estimate. And then because people understand time T 
typically more than they understand risk if you're not a statistician. We typically translate these things to the time scale. So how many days faster did somebody get well because of the new treatment compared to the standard treatment? So that would be the difference in the mean time and state between treatments. Now computing, uh, there's special advantages of doing this in the Bayesian framework with posterior sampling. If you've ever tried to use the delta method, we're all taught the delta method, and it's always very disappointing to me because it's a little messy and it gives you symmetric confidence intervals when the confidence intervals should definitely not be symmetric. What if you had a multi-step uh, derived parameter that you wanted to apply the delta method to? It's a nightmare. And so it's very hard to derive uh, confidence limits from these uh, on things like mean time in states three or four. But when you're doing your posterior draws, you get your posterior draws, let's like say 4,000 draws from each of your basic parameters. For each of these 4,000 draws, you compute whatever you want. It could be a state occupancy probability, could be a mean time in state, and you're going to get from those 4,000 posterior evaluations of your drive parameter just using the computer, and it's really very simple, you're going to get exact uh, posterior distributions of complex derived parameters, at least exact to within simulation error. And if you don't like uh, that simulation error, just increase the number of simulations. So I think this is quite remarkable that, that Bayes uh, replaces very complex multidimensional integrals with just very, very simple simulation. So the software for doing all this in the frequentist world, which will not give you state occupancy probabilities or confidence intervals, but just your transition model parameters, the VGAM package in R is one of the most versatile and general packages uh, for very, very big family of generalized additive models, including semi-parametric models like proportional odds and partial proportional odds. And in the Bayesian world, I have the RMSB package, and that's really uh, set up to handle interval censoring of ordinal longitudinal outcomes and univariate outcomes, and it will also handle um, partial proportional odds and constrained partial proportional odds models. So this is where you can go for more information. This is my central hub for a ton of reports and background information, a lot more about longitudinal modeling, detailed case studies. They're more detailed than you would ever want to see for three studies, including the NIH Remdesivir study reanalyzed using this method instead of using time to recovery. And you can show with simulations that I've done that time to recovery loses a good deal of power compared to using longitudinal status analysis. I've got a bibliography of Markov modeling and a bibliography of longitudinal ordinal analysis and a bibliography of general longitudinal data analysis. So let me see if I had anything else here. Oh, I've got um, introduction to the proportional odds model and more about proportional odds uh, and then how to design clinical trials with regard to outcomes in general. So a lot of resources that I hope some of this will be interesting to you. And I, I really appreciate your listening. I hope some of you have some uh, discussion or questions. Thank you very much, Frank. That, that's great. Survival analysis is one of my favorite areas too. And I've often worried about this is old stuff. We should be doing something better. And, <laughs> and you clearly are. Um, it, if there are non-panelists that have questions, please uh, either raise your hand or, or put it in the chat or, or Q&A. Um, Frank, one of the other survival models that's out there are Alan's additive hazard models. Is that something related in all to this? It certainly isn't as general as this, but is there a way that you can tie what's here to that? I, I have not thought about that. I think it's an excellent question. Um, I've only thought about the the um, single terminating event Cox model and a little bit about some of the competing risk stuff. Um, uh, 
that doesn't use the additive hazard model. But I, I think it would be worth uh, considering to see if there is a tie-in. I tend to avoid additive hazard just because I, I don't think you should be adding hazards together. I think hazards tend to multiply a little bit more than they tend to add. Thank you. Now, somebody must be offended at something I've said, <laughs> and they want to get it off their chest now. <laughs> I was just wondering uh, another thing. I, I'm, I'll try to find something offensive, but I haven't yet. Uh, is uh, when you work in certain regions of, say, a, lo uh, a logistic model, um, the, the linear regions, if you're fortunate to be low or middle or high, th then, then you can almost see a multiplicative effects when you add um, covariates. And is any of that stuff, do you ever use any of that approximation when you're in, in this, or is it all just, ha it handles the full shape of the curve? I think it handles the first full shape, but I tend to think about that in a slightly different way, which is if you, if you had a regular univariate analysis, you weren't getting into all these things. Um, and I, I think of continuous variables usually needing to have their transformation estimated from the data, uh, because that'll, that'll allow you to be accurate over a wider range when you don't assume something's linear. So I, I use a lot of spline functions, a lot of regression splines in continuous covariates. I very seldom assume they're linear on the logit scale unless I have a very small sample says, and I just don't have the freedom to estimate more parameters. All right. One, one question from the audience, uh, Nick, Nick Henderson, uh, has got his hand up. Nick, do you want to ask your question? Oh, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Thanks. I was just wondering, um, so for these types of kind of multi-state models that you're using, are there any I guess, clean measures of predictive performance that you would suggest of, so you know, for example, with, um, I mean, just a classic continuous outcome. If you did uh, like a cross validation measure of performance, you would just do MSE. Uh, so kind of what, are there any kind of, I don't know, what, what do you do in practice or do you, or do you ever do that? Yeah, I think, uh, I haven't thought about putting together the longitudinal run part of this, but it, at, a, at a given time point, uh, people use uh, C index or Somers D rank correlation, or, you know, these are related to ROC area things, concordance probabilities. Uh, you can do that at separate times to see how well it pr predicts at a, at a given single time and then do that at multiple times. I do uh, also like generalized R squared measures, uh, which are easier to think about in the univariate case again. But um, I like uh, I like pseudo R squared um, that come from the log likelihood. And they're, uh, they can work in longitudinal setups when you have a log likelihood, unlike if you had GEE or something. Uh, so I think there are some pseudo R scores that might be handy. I, I'm not sure they're instantly interpretable. So I think your question is an area we need more thought about. Thanks. Frank, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I can read out or you, you can read yourself. Uh, Brandy's the first one asking, uh, thanks for an interesting presentation. One thing that troubles me about the proportional odds model is the interpretation is that an increase in X is associated with greater odds but doesn't allow quantification of the increase in X with the specific values of the outcome. Do you have a different interpretation of the proportional odds model? Yeah, and so there's, uh, I, have, I have two resources for that. One is I have, I'm gonna put in the, um, in the chat, the, uh, a link that'll get you to a, um, a, a set of like 500 pages of notes that I have for Biostat course. Um, and in that, in those notes, um, is a detailed section about how to do sample size calculations for Wilcoxon test. 
using the proportional odds model, and it shows how to translate odds ratios into differences in means and ratios of means. So this is more for the continuous case. So there is a way to do that. And I have a little nomogram that will translate a um, odds ratio into a standardized difference in means if you had a normal distribution like a two sample t-test. So there is a, there's a way to correspond uh, a proportional odds, odds ratio to a z-score or, or Cohen's d or whatever you want to call it for a standardized difference in means. So there are some things that will get you part of the way there. And there's uh, another question from Scott. Uh, you've advocated for the use of ordinal regression models for continuous Y. However, many others are silent on this topic. Why? Yeah, I, I think, uh, and it's good to see Scott here. Uh, I think um, I think they're a little less silent about it because one of our graduate students produced kind of the fundamental paper justifying the use of proportional odds model and other cumulative probability models for continuous outcomes and show it performs beautifully and it has uh, good theoretical properties also. So um, this is something we're really pushing at Vanderbilt. We have a lot of our graduate students working on semi-parametric models and extending them in various ways, but this, the, the continuous case has been extremely well established now. And in some of these course notes, like the link I just put in the chat, uh, I think like I have, um, I have a section in there about how to do the Wilcoxon test with a proportional odds model when you have a continuous outcome variable. So we have more and more teaching materials, but the performance is what really makes it fly. You know, efficient, robust, fewer assumptions, and we have computational tools for making it feasible to have up to uh, 6,000 intercepts in one model. So uh, I, I think it's really getting there. It's ready for prime time. Scott, you, if you have another thing on your mind about that, feel free to continue that discussion. Is there something in, inherently valuable about the log, the, the, the log transformation, or will any, you know, complementary log log or whatever help, or is it just convenient because there's a lot of software already for logistic regression? Well, in my in my book, regression modeling strategies, I have an example where the log log link worked way better than the proportional odds or log link. So it's not always the best, but the log log links. Some people don't like the fact that it's asymmetric, whereas the logit link, like the probit link, is a symmetric function. So there's there's a little bit of appeal to, to symmetry in the transformation. And of course, the real reason people use logistic models, uh, they're they're very tractable and they give you an interpretation that is something people have seen without a logistic model, which is an odds ratio. So when you're doing probit uh, ordinal regression, you don't have anything you can call uh, an effect ratio or, you know, it, who knows what scale that, that probit coefficient is on. It's, it doesn't have the natural interpretation that you get from a log-log link, which would be a hazard ratio uh, or uh, a logit link with an odds ratio. Uh, last call for questions from the audience. I can either unmute you or start typing, raise your hand. I'm gonna put up a link. Uh, this is a brand new page that I just put up, which is really an introduction to proportional odds model and with a whole lot of resources and, and links to uh, various uh, lecture notes and things. So for people who are 
a little bit new to the proportionalized and other related semi-parametric models. I think this this uh, this has a bibliography and it has what are the key points uh, that make these models attractive. And Frank, did you also mention you have a blog on a different website? Yeah, that's uh, fherald.com and it has several articles about the proportional odds model. Uh, and th the links to those articles are from that previous link that I just put, uh, that bib slash PO link. That'll link you to the blog articles that are relevant, but there's a whole lot of blog articles in there, including the latest one is showing what the disadvantages of using random effects for longitudinal data are. Uh, the, the one comment was that the first link hadn't gone through. So I posted that. That's kind of the, the route that uh, you can go through to get to all this, all the good stuff that's on yeah, the website. Yeah, and the bib slash PO one will show you which parts of the BBR to look at. Okay. So there's a lot of material there. And um, I, I uh, one of the things that really drives uh, my thinking of all this is... Um, I don't want to depend on choosing the right transformation of the dependent variable. That's one of the main things that got me into uh, ordinal modeling. That's great. Well, Frank, thank you for giving us a lot of guideposts on where to go with questions that aren't cookie cutter survival analysis. I, I agree the Cox model has its, its use. It's, it's, Perhaps it's one use, but uh, there's so much more that you can do if you have something beyond just the simplest case. Uh, I appreciate hearing about it. Um, well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for inviting me, Chris. My pleasure. I uh, hope to see the rest of you back uh, in early, early May, I guess, for our next uh, gathering, so to speak. Bye-bye, uh, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Bye. Bye-bye.